So what's going on here? Any takers? I'm not telling you. You tell me what it is. Then I'll tell you how old they are. <laughs> but as I say, but that the fact that you're asking that tells me that right away you clearly know that this is a child. And you're right. How you can figure out even from low power, you can get the impression this is a fibrous hamartoma of infancy. Usually, obviously, in infants and young children. And the thing that, that can be kind of scary about them from low power is they look like a pink spindle cell tumor with entrapment of fat. So if you're having a bad day, you could see this area and think dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. You could see this is the honeycomb pattern of fat entrapment. It looks relatively similar sometimes. Um, but the, the components of fibrous hamartoma, there, there are three. I will tell you in a minute. But the other thing I want to point out is that when you look from low power, in DFSP, normally there's one kind of main tumor mass, not always, but usually, and then it infiltrates out towards the periphery and you get that fat trapping. But here, there, I mean, where's the center of the tumor? Like this thing? Like it's, it's all just kind of a patchwork, all like hodgepodge together, like a quilt almost or something, right? That there's a lot of different areas that are busy, but it doesn't seem like there's any one main tumor mass infiltrating fat. It's just all kind of mixed and intermingled together. The one area that could be confusing is this up here, which if I recall, I, I want to say that this was a scar from a biopsy, but I, I can't remember for sure. And I think that as this got larger, they just took it out because it was making a mass, not because they were worried about it. Um, but I can't remember the exact scenario. So there's there's three components um, to, um, to fibrous hamartoma of infancy. And what are those three components? Exactly. Yeah, that's so the three things are fat, fibroblastic spindle cells running in parallel, like nice, well-formed fascicles. See how like nicely packed those are and how they really run kind of almost like the fascicles you'd see, say, in a desmoid fibromatosis, just a lot smaller, not nowhere near as long or as broad, but very much parallel fascicles of fibroblasts with background collagen. And how do we know that these are fibroblasts and collagen? Because look at that waviness right there. When collagen gets really wavy, it looks almost like ramen noodles in a package. And I've got a little video about that. One of my former fellows, Ed Fulton, said it, it's the ramen noodle sign. And so I've now dubbed it the ramen noodle sign of Ed Fulton in his honor because I just think it's such a beautiful analogy that when you get this really ripply, wavy looking collagen, that's very characteristic of dense regular connective tissue like tendon, fascia, or ligament, and also of fibroblastic or myofibroblastic proliferations. So you can see that with spindle cells and collagen wavy like that, you're almost certainly dealing with fibroblasts or myofibroblasts and really unlikely to be dealing with nerve if it's that wavy. Exceptions exist, but usually. Um, so yeah, you get the fascicles of the fibroblasts, the mature adipocytes, and then these little round nodules, which really to me are the key to making the diagnosis. And we call these immature mesenchyme because we say they look immature. I don't honestly really know what immature means. I'll be honest and say that. I mean, to me, I guess it means like they look like cells that don't look like anything else. Or I guess like some areas of develop in fetal development, you get like some cells that are just in these sheets like this. So I guess um, if I knew more embryology, probably I would recognize why that looks uh, immature. But for me, they're kind of these little balls of round to spindled cells. They're arranged in tight aggregates and they often have kind of a grayish, bluish sort of looking background um, in between them. And so you can see them there. You can see them up here. See again, they're here. So that's a really nice example of fibrous hamartoma of infancy. You don't want to confuse it with dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, which can also occur in kids. There's here's more mesenchyme here. So um, if you're having a difficult case, you know, looking around for these is the is really the key to to making the diagnosis. Otherwise, um, the other tumor that can kind of look like this is lipofibromatosis in childhood. Um, they can have like these fascicles um, that really intersect in, in trapped fat and can have a lot of overlapping features, I think, in some cases um, with fibrous hamartoma of infancy. And so um, in challenging cases with those, getting someone involved who knows about pediatric pathology can be helpful because they're much more likely to have seen cases of those. Oh, and the one other point I'd make is that I don't know, I've seen a fair number of DFSP now, but I don't know if I've ever seen them with really good fascicles. The only time they make really well-formed fascicles is when they're fibrosarcomatous, and then they're going to be not fascicles spaced out with a pink background. They're going to be like blue hypercellular herringbone fascicles that look like synovial sarcoma, kind of. So not like these um, fascicles that are hypocellular and, and pink with collagen dividing the cells nicely. 
So um, if I see nice fascicle formation like this, that's a good evidence it's probably not DFSP if I'm having any trouble. And look again, look at that ramen noodle sign. You see what I'm saying? Look at how wavy that is. So nice. Wavy, if it's really wavy, usually means fibroblast, not nerve. Contrary to popular opinion. All right. Questions? Yeah, good question. So how do you distinguish it from fibromatosis? Well, good if you have if you have fascicles that look like this, you could seriously consider fibromatosis. But finding the mesenchyme, those mesenchymal islands, I've never seen that in desmoid fibromatosis. The other thing I think that's helpful is that in desmoid uh, tumors and fibromatosis, you can get entrapment of fat and of skeletal muscle. Particularly, I, I think I see entrapment of skeletal muscle even more than fat but at the periphery of the tumor, but you'll get like little islands of stranded atrophic muscle in it, or you'll get, um, you'll get little blobs of fat here and there, but you don't see um, desmoid tumor do this. You don't, desmoid tumor, I've never seen it do that, like make like a, a honeycomb kind of pattern. DFSP can do this, but desmoid fibromatosis, I don't think I've ever seen it like trickle in between individual adipocytes. It's more like broad fascicles going out and trapping little groups of fat in it. And also there's gonna be a main tumor mass that's gonna be huge, really broad, long sweeping fascicles. That's the main tumor mass and the fat infiltration or muscle infiltration will be just seen at the periphery. So that's the other thing. And then the final thing is that I don't think the only times I've ever seen desmoid fibromatosis in the skin and subcutis is if it's growing from down below, like off of the abdominal rectus muscle sheath and then pushing up, I've seen it do that, but it was like an eight centimeter mass coming from deep pushing up into skin, but it's usually desmoid tumors are deep soft tissue tumors um, from the fascia or below, whereas fibrous hamartomas, I think all of the ones I've ever seen have been subcutaneous and uh, with sometimes with involvement of the dermis, but they usually are centered in the subcutis and they're often on like the chest near the upper chest axilla shoulder region in, in kids that are, you know, infants or one or two or three years old, something like that. So, um, any other comments? Uh, Van, as a pediatric pathologist, do you have any comments you want to share with us? I'm having to repeat this so it goes onto my microphone, but uh, Van Hung, a uh, really excellent pediatric pathologist, I'm glad to hear that he said that even he struggles with telling fibrous hamartoma of infancy apart from lipofibromatosis, except for the main thing being the presence of these mesenchymal islands um, in, um, in fibrous hamartoma, but not in lipofibromatosis. So I'm glad to know that I'm not alone because I've often found it very challenging otherwise to, to sort them out. So 